Well, hello, friends and fellow pioneers. Today, we're going to talk about such an important topic, especially a hot topic for today. Everyone wants to build community or build, build community or be in a really good community. Uh, well, how do you achieve that? So today we have Cynthia Tina. I first heard her speak uh, last fall, and we um, decided to record this broadcast so that she can bring her story and her wisdom from all the years that she's traveled and experienced some amazing communities. And I really just want to give her the opportunity uh, to just share anything that comes to mind that can be valuable and actionable for such a time as this. And so these exciting times that we live in, I believe this is going to be a very special broadcast. Community is one thing that Jason and I are really focusing on this season of our pioneering journey. And so with that, Cynthia, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to let you share with us what, what are the life events and what are the, the things that happened that got you into this work, work of intentional communities and matchmaking people with their perfect intentional community. Just tell us how it all began. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much, Aurora. Hi, everyone. Really glad to be here and grateful for the opportunity to share. Um, so I'm calling in from Vermont. You can actually see it's it's supposed to be spring, but we're having some snow. So you might be able to see that in my background. And I live here at an eco village called Headwaters Community. We're about a dozen people with lots of children who tend land and a big garden, and we um, all have built our own homes on the property. The community's been around for about 10 years. I'm one of the newer residents, so I'm in the process of still building my house, which has been a big adventure. Uh, so I did not grow up in an intentional community, but this has been my main passion and life's work up until this point to help people learn about intentional communities, get inspired, and support them in starting communities. And especially my work is helping them join existing communities as this community matchmaker and um, uh, coach or support person. So, uh, yeah, as I say, I didn't grow up in an intentional community, um, grew up in a pretty typical suburban, urban kind of environment, and was at a young age pretty, uh, disenchanted with society. I was curious about alternative ways of procuring food, so started a garden at a young age, um, was super inspired by stories of people who were kind of forging their own path, um, uh, going out there and creating homesteads, um, starting communities. And then I was fortunate enough at age 15 to go to my first intentional community, although I didn't quite know that's what it was at the time, but it certainly was. And this is a place called Turtle Island in North Carolina. And that just opened my eyes to not only a whole new way of living, but just say like a sense of deeper belonging and purpose, meaning than I had experienced in my life um, up until that point. You know, at this time I was still in high school and I had friends, but they didn't share my values or my interests. They maybe thought I was a little strange for uh, bringing my carrots, you know, to, to lunch and my food scraps home to compost and spending my summers in the woods. Um, so I think through these early life experiences and then going on to travel to the point where I've now visited over 100 different intentional communities around the world, um, has just really confirmed for me the importance of these places for us to see ways that we can be more sustainable um, and be good stewards of the land and also foster deeper relationships with each other and get that support um, that we, we need as humans, as humans who have evolved 
in small social groups. And yet in modern times, we've seen such a breakdown of community and people really suffering from loneliness and isolation. So that's a little bit about my story. And I'll let you go ahead and ask your next question. Thank, thank you so much, Cynthia, for sharing that. Now, I mean, a hundred different communities, that's just mind blowing um, to just, you know, just imagine the wealth of experiences and the diversity that you've experienced. Mm -hmm. And that really makes me want to ask, like, I realized that where you live, maybe one of your favorite ones you visited, but just overall over the uh, span of time and experiences that you've had, tell us a little bit about the your favorite and why was it your favorite after all these experiences and traveling that you've done? Mm, mm, that's a good question. Yeah, so I definitely love the place where I live uh, here in Vermont. And um, I love, you know, being, I, I love New England and my family is from here. So it feels uh, very fitting for me. Um, I also have been incredibly inspired, inspired by um, some communities in uh, Europe, especially the community where my partner lives. It's called Sunny Hills. And it's a small community in Slovenia that they are uh, creating out of an abandoned village. So in Europe, there's all of these stone villages that were built to last centuries. And slowly they've been abandoned as people move to the city. And so they're, they're falling down. And this community has come in to restore and re-inhabit um, a traditional village. And it's beautiful. They have goats and grow a lot of their own food and just, you know, gorgeous landscape and architecture and sweet community culture. So that's a community that's very near and dear to my heart. I would say like the, the grandest or the most um, awe-inspiring community I visited is in Oroville. Uh, it's a community in India with around 3,000 residents and just like huge scale. It is, it is a spiritual community, but also has a strong focus on uh, regenerative landscape design. They have a lot of food forests and farms and gardens, people from all around the world. And the intention of this community is to be a center of unity and really embracing all of the various cultures of the world and um, be a place for humanity to gather. So I felt very grateful to get to experience that community and um, I could go on, but those are, those are just a few of my favorites. So thank you for sharing that. So what are some other things from that favorite, uh, those two favorite uh, communities in Europe and India that you're experiencing now in your place where you are? Hmm. Hmm. Some of the things I'm experiencing now. Well, I think food and the land is a strong theme in all of these communities. And I wouldn't want to mislead anyone. Um, there are many intentional communities that are in the cities and don't have food or agriculture as a strong component. Um, but it's definitely been something that's uh, a strong theme in my life and something that I... Um, think a lot about the food that I put into my body. And, you know, right now it's uh, it's spring here in Vermont, like I said. So we're coming out of the winter and still have a lot of root vegetables that we harvested as a community that are in our root cellar. We have this um, large, actually, earthship greenhouse. And at the end of it, is a, um, a damp room that we use as our root cellar as a community. So we still have veggies there, but now we have all of the spring um, greens coming out of our hoop house and some other um, foods from the woods, like wild ramps, which are kind of like leeks. Uh, so I am feeling inspired around how we can collectively come together um, with food. We just had a big work party in our garden as a community. And, um, and along with that, I would say having the kids in our community engaging with that and just having multi-generational communities, which is a, another thread throughout those few communities I mentioned that are my favorite. 
and having this real village sense, like hearing kids laugh and play outside. Everyone, you know, kind of has an eye on them and what's happening, making sure they're okay, but they have so much independence and autonomy. Many of them are homeschooled. So it's just like a far cry from my upbringing in a private Catholic school. Um, they're just having such a different childhood and being able to, even through this pandemic, stay connected with their friends and play outside just feels like an incredible gift and um, something that's inspiring me in community. Well, thank you. I just really love, you know, connecting the patterns of how we experience things. And then we try to, um, well, you know, it just really opens our eyes for what we really appreciate or don't appreciate in life. I think the more experiences that we have, the richer our life becomes, because, uh, again, there's that wealth of experience guiding us um, mm -hmm. into what legacy we want to lead. Uh, when we th see either injustice or maybe things being ineffective, and then we want the opposite. Um, and I totally can relate to the, you know, we kind of call it the pandemic around here. But, you know, when that time <laughs> in 2020 broke out, um, th that was the, this, it's been the best season of our lives. It really has Thank not you. limited us to, um, be more isolated or more you know we actually are having more community now than ever because we yeah. were um kind we kind of basically 10 years ago had decided make it a made an intentional choice to create an oh. experience that would put us in i guess in a simulated apocalypse because we knew we didn't have the skills to survive like we knew what was coming mm -hmm. we, we knew i mean we are um very strong in our faith and we do believe the bible and we do believe that we have been told like prepare for very um challenging times ahead and um community is a really really important part of that but we actually removed ourselves from the community that we had to prepare ourselves to create the community that we felt we needed to have to really be able to withstand to to even stand <laughs> to, to to be left standing at the end we knew that where we were we had too many comforts and we did not have enough life skills strong life skills to survive in a situation and so with that conviction that we really feel like if you are going to be able to, to really learn how to thrive, you first have to learn how to survive living off the grid. And then you can add all the other components to that. But if you start with that foundation of having a really secure ecosystem that doesn't really need all the, the comforts of modern <laughs> in the industrialized world, um, to, to us, that's what truly resilience is. Mm -hmm. And I know that you've experienced some uh, amazing expressions of that in the intentional communities that you've visited. Um, one thing I'm curious about is how did you, you know, from the background that you had from growing up like that, even though that you were, you know, felt the way you did about society, how did you connect? <laughs> like, how, how did you go from uh, what you had experienced with society to looking at intentional communities and visiting that like hmm. what what connected you with that world of intentional communities mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah well i love to travel and have adventures and i just have such a curiosity about the world and fortunately enough family support and um, privilege to be able to, to travel and pursue my interests and my passions. Um, so actually, I, I was um, at, at one point, I was attending um, a university, St. Lawrence University in upstate New York, and um, participated in a program called the Adirondack Semester, 
which was a semester where we were living in a small village of yurts in the Adirondack Park, so in the woods, just 12 students. And our professors would come to us and, uh, and teach us classes. And we would write our term papers by candlelight when the solar panels went out. Like it was really this unique experience and, and a deep community experience. And I used that semester to make the decision to transfer to another college, which is where I ended up getting my degree. I have a degree in sustainability from Goddard College. And Goddard is a you only need to be on campus for one week each semester. There's no classes. You kind of design your own curriculum and you learn how to be your own teacher. Uh, so I used my final years of college to travel and wound up woofing on different farms and visiting different communities and ended up going to an eco-village conference. So every summer in Europe, usually around July, there is the European eco-village conference. Um, so I went to this event uh, didn't really know that this was a whole movement. Like I had these individual experiences with community, with, you know, farms that had a strong community component. I knew this was a big interest of mine. Um, but when I arrived at that conference, I think that's when it hit me that this is a network. This is a movement. This is a different culture. And I felt um, fortunately, really embraced by the people that I met and was offered um, a leadership position in the youth organization. So the, the young people who are trying to support young people in intentional community and getting more involved. Uh, so this, you know, this leads you on a journey where then you step into other leadership positions and suddenly not only is this an interest, but it's also um, a career as well. So that's that's how I, I made the transition. I don't think I, you know, had this as my plan. It was more so a series of events that led me on a certain path. And then I was able to look back and kind of connect the dots and say, oh, yeah, I think community and that desire for deeper authenticity and connection and resiliency, like you shared, um, is what was the thread that wove together those experiences and, and how I see my story. That's so awesome. What a rich experience you had for your, you know, those formative years of college. And I, I love that actually in our virtual academy, we have a, a similar um, cu customized path for people. And um, I love hearing that you have that experience. And I mean, it, once you have those training wheels, I mean, you had the professors come and all of that, but once you have your training wheels and it just takes away all these ideas of what you can and can't do mm. and you see, hey, this is possible, you know, and then you just can go a little bit farther with it, you know, a little bit, um, a step farther and farther into um pioneering new experiences or or even giving yourself the opportunity to go visit places that may be a little bit of a stretch right um, yeah. that's been my experience I had never even been camping <laughs> we quit society and moved to raw land <laughs> I had never built a fire I mean so I became the resident fire starter because Jason was like oh this I mean we just had so many things and it was like a really um strong rainy season after a drought this was after mm -hmm. the backdrop fires of 2011 i mean it was like a crazy time we had drought on fires one year and like a super crazy rainy season and all the wood was wet <laughs> and i mean we just didn't know what we didn't know but you survived that and you're like i mean you know I can I can start fires now. Like, you know, uh, I didn't even know how important that was, really. I mean, that's just how how much I guess just how some people call it green, but like how inexperienced we were, but we had such a strong conviction that we had to do this. Like this, mm -hmm. you know, it was like we life was really not worth living if we didn't pursue this. 
And um, we didn't really have, uh, it's so beautiful that you did have like this community that embraced you and uh, took you on and, um, and, and now, you know, um, built a platform, you know, how, where you have a, a career. Um, you know, that's so beautiful that you can give other people the gift of that support, you know, that you experience. And this is why I, we're so hungry for it because we didn't have it. And, um, you know, and we met again through the Exit and Build Summit. And that was our investment in um, community, in the Central Texas community, um, mm -hmm. because we, Jason had tried to connect with the Freedom Cell Network in the past. And it just um he had not been able to get connected yet and um and so again you know we have such different experiences but it all leads to community you know yeah. it's the importance of making it intentional you know and, and everything that we teach in our academy is about taking the time to understand what's important to you so that you can be intentional about how that's going to show up in your life because if you're mm -hmm. not intentional someone else will create something for you an alternative that you don't have to think about but they don't have your best intentions or they don't have your best interest in mind um and so it's not what you would have created so being intentional about community it's like to me um honestly just a foundational um step that people really have to take they have to be intentional about how community is going to be in their lives otherwise they're going to find themselves in these reactive relationships and these reactive spaces and environments that they never would have chosen and i mean that is no life to live to to me <laughs> it, you know after all of our experiences like why why not be intentional about how you live your life yeah. where you live it and who you live it with and mm -hmm. i love that you are um, found the community that you did and that um, I can just see you're <laughs> radiating, you know, just from, from being there and as you share that. And there are a lot of us that wanna create communities. And um, and I really appreciate the, the work that you're doing, you know, to bring awareness that these communities do exist, it is possible. So that brings me to my next question. In the experiences that you've had, not just visiting the communities, but living in them, and, uh, and uh, in the experimental things that you've done to experience intentional communities and community living, what's been the hardest challenge? Like what's been the biggest challenge that you have faced? You know, we all have ideas on what could go wrong <laughs> or what's gonna be the hardest. And mm -hmm. understanding we all have different strengths and we all have different um, biases and things like that. But just in general, you know, if you can share with us your personal experience and maybe some things that you've seen that, you know, so we can really name there are some things to work through um, living in community. I really want to have that conversation here so that we're realistic. So because the, the more that we plant, that we're strategic about reality, like the, the real um, pains and the real threats, then we can I mean, if, if we see them, we can overcome them, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a great question. And to what you were sharing earlier, I think it's so true. Many of us just go live where we have family or where we have jobs. We don't, you know, we buy our house on the mainstream market. We don't really put a lot of thought into where we live, or even if we're not moving, um, about you know who are we spending time with? How can we create more community in our lives? How can we seek out our people? Um, so it's it's so important. And uh, in terms of challenges, yes, this is also something to think about. Yeah, um, and to go into intentional community thinking, oh, it's going to be great all the time, and having these rosy colored glasses. Uh, I think that, um, uh, you know, it is a amazing experience. And in fact, I think sometimes the challenges that come up are what make it worth it because you learn so much about yourself and other people and how to move through difficulty. Uh, so yeah, the biggest challenges that I have experienced are all related to interpersonal dynamics. So communication, 
uh, conflicts, um, knowing how to resolve differences, knowing how to make decisions together, having good processes for group decision making, um, whether you look at that as a governance structure or how you conduct your meetings, how you facilitate, how you follow up and keep people accountable. Like these are some of the most difficult issues because a lot of us don't learn these things in school. You know, there's always an authority or a structure in place. We don't have much practice with co-creating how to be together as a group. And, um, you know, and it's also not like there's the one right way to do it or the best practice that's suitable for everyone. There's um, the saying in the intentional communities movement that the best decision-making practice is the one that works for that particular group. So it's really getting comfortable with being in a culture of experimentation, of giving each other feedback, of learning, of trying things out and seeing what works, and being open to things changing with time. Um, so yeah, these are some, some challenges. I could share a small story. Um, it's a Something that happened pretty recently in our community, which, as I mentioned, was uh, created over 10 years ago. And we did have a, um, a founder, um, a woman who purchased the land initially and got all the permitting and the zoning and really created the community. And um, I feel so grateful for having, you know, a strong pioneer. Um, she actually had some experience in um, working with city planning. So she kind of had the mindset and knew how to work with bureaucracy to make this vision happen. Um, but at the same time, inherent in that was a power structure and um, a difficult dynamic as then later more residents entered the community and she's still holding, you know, if not explicitly, maybe implicitly, a lot of the power. And then how do we transition to that being a group thing? Um, so this has been something that's been quite the journey and um, has created, you know, at times a lot of stress and you even wonder, oh my gosh, you know, did I make the right decision? Is this the right thing? But then you realize this is a really precious learning experience because I'm going to learn so much through this and then be able to support other communities who might be facing similar challenges. Um, so, Wow. That, well, thank you for, you know, sharing from your such a I guess real, <laughs> real and present experience with us because I mean I just really feel like with all all pioneering, whatever people are pioneering, the more honest and balanced view that you can have of the situation of the challenge, especially the challenges, because we don't get into situations without seeing some opportunities and to. Um, you know, have the benefits, right? The generally <laughs> benefits are what we're seeking. Um, you know, but those challenges is what, like you said, that's what's going to make the experience help you grow. And, you know, like something that I've thought in all the different experiences we've had is you either grow bitter or you grow better. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know, to, to be able to grow and it's so hard. Mm -hmm. I think, I do think forgiveness is such a uh like sometimes you know just forgiving ourselves for getting into that situation and not knowing better that that wasn't a good fit or you know those kind of things and also you know and not being guilt ridden you know not being weighed down by guilt is it you know it's part of the growing process and then forgiving the people for the expectations that we held of them forgiving people for um the intentional things they did do, <laughs> you know, that they didn't care um, what the, maybe the pain or the suffering or the things that they, that it caused because, you know, as we're just selfish by nature, really. And so just being able to, um, like you said, that, that inner work is so important to be able to just let go and, and you know, so that 
that we can grow. I mean, it's just critical <laughs> to be able to be with people. And when you were sharing that, it made me think about like basically intentional communities, everything that you share is family. It's what you deal within families, but with an intentional community, you don't get married or move away, you're actually moving in. <laughs> so you really have no place to go. Um, and it also made me think about something I haven't shared often, at least publicly, but we don't have a, a mirrors hanging anywhere in our tiny home. And, you know, looking back after so many of the breakthroughs, like personal breakthroughs that I feel that I've had, I honestly feel like not having a mirror helped me more than, I mean, some, some, sometimes, you know, like a mirror kind of helps you face yourself. But I think being with yourself <laughs> and being with people, being more present, not just image, you know, because we're so visual, but not being distracted by the external things to be able to really be present with yourself. And you have no, I mean, you have nowhere else to go. There's no the distraction of your reflection. There's not a whole lot, the, the more primitive, you know, and simple that you live, you really have to deal with yourself. <laughs> you really have to deal with other people. But then you build a, a muscle of resilience with relationships. And we have such a long, long way to go. But I am very grateful for the experiences that we have had and the risks that we have taken with relationships and with ourselves <laughs> to, um, to be able to do that. Another thing that came to mind when you share that, Cynthia, is that the very reason we ended up in Central Texas was that we had moved well everywhere i had moved that i had lived was for opportunity so i came to the united states uh, 30 years ago with my family because they um, had to um, continue their education you know like uh, continuing education requirements they were university professors so that you know it was a work-related thing that brought us to the united states then I meet Jason the last year we were here. I told him I'm going back to Venezuela. And he said, uh, we'll see about that. So he came back and got me in 98. <laughs> we were apart for four and a half long months. <laughs> um, and then um, we moved back to Mississippi is where we met. We do our, um, you know, finish our university uh, studies. And then on just, we, we moved to Northern Kentucky for work. We moved to Mexico for work. And we were kind of like feeling like we were just being pulled. Like you said, you know, you just move where the job takes you or move where the family takes you. And we really did have that, what I call that red pill moment. Like we've been moving because of work. What if we move and then create work where we move? Like, <laughs> what would that look like? And that's why um, we looked at all of North America for, um, the intentional list that we had so we didn't have the intentional community but we had the intentional location <laughs> and uh, we had a lot of things that we strategically were looking for to stop chasing or following what somebody else opportunity they were willing to open for us and create the opportunities ourselves and so that's why we ended up in this area and um and so i shared with you that the reason we met is because we were in search for community and um even though we moved here to like establish roots and build community and like finally stop moving we were the most isolated you know those first like eight plus years mm -hmm. because i mean we moved here as pioneers and you know we didn't know anybody else that was doing what we were doing and back then there were no like homesteaders of YouTube, you know, all these, um, the movement that we are experiencing now, it was not there. And so we were just quietly and secretly doing, uh, learning how to go, you know, from raw land to how do we do shelter? How do we do food? How do we do energy? How do we do all of these things? Um, and so we really didn't have community by way of like interest, you know, like um, support in like what we were doing. We've generally we've been pretty much in all of our different communities um like uh but it is it like um like an anomaly <laughs> so so uh so all so sometimes the interests um uh, are very different right for people that even for people at homestead then we have different interests than that and so um but that built our resilience like to be able to just 
thrive despite of the approval of other people, thrive despite mm -hmm. of other people being interested in it because we were doing it out of conviction based on our faith, not these ideals of how it was gonna just bring community to us and all of that. Mm -hmm. So now we're working really, really hard to learn even more about how to build community with people that wanna do what we do and how to show people the benefits and the value of what um, creating community and to be intentional, uh, what that can bring people. And so those are just some things from our journey that you know, popped up and became so real in my memory as you were sharing that it is so true how um, we generally are pulled and not mm -hmm. intentional in um, how community happens in our lives. So tell us about some of the top lessons that you've learned um, from not just the conflicts and the challenges, but also the, um, you know, the beautiful, the beautiful things that you've experienced, the, the benefits, the life. Mm. Um, you kind of share some of the things that you loved about the communities that you experienced. But, you know, if you were to share maybe some of the top things that you've um, top lessons you've learned um, that you saw made things work or not work. Right? Like, what does it require to have those benefits and, and those uh, pleasures in life? And what are some of the things you've learned cause, you know, the pain and the, the conflict and suffering? Mm, okay. Top lessons. Hmm. Well, I think a simple one, which is really applicable for anyone, whether you're living in an intentional community or not, is to figure out ways, designing your space, designing your habits and routines, to put yourself in more regular, casual contact with other people, with your community. Um, you can think of these as moments of building community glue. Yeah, so whether it's hosting a potluck, whether it's waving to your neighbors on your porch, you know, and making a point to sit out in a more public space, um, creating for more meaningful connection and allowing that to, in turn, strengthen your network and strengthen your resiliency as a community because you already have some familiarity with folks and it's good for your your you know just psyche as a person your your health um, there's lots of studies that show that having more casual social interaction is really good for our health and not like I don't know the more superficial or unintentional ways of interaction, like just going to a party or, you know, something like this, but really deeper, meaningful moments of connection with other people. So for example, in our community, we actually don't have a community um, common house, which is really common in a lot of other intentional communities, like a space where everyone gathers and cooks meals. Um, we are thinking of maybe building it. It would take a lot to heat and maintain through the winter. So that's kind of our hesitancy. Uh, but what we do have is this whole network of pathways going through the forests that kind of connect each other to all of the houses, not just within our community, but also our neighbors' houses. And uh, the kids feel super comfortable just like running through the woods and they probably could walk these trails in the dark, no problem. And I think that this is something that, in a real sense, creates our community glue and our, our network of community that binds us together. Um, so that's something you could think about. What else could I offer? Lessons learned. Um, I think something for myself that has been huge. And we've already talked about it a bit, like growing as a person. I think a lot of that growth process happens through being open to feedback, um, like really open to critical feedback and welcoming that. 
And when you get a piece of feedback, really thinking, oh, this is so valuable because this is really going to help me grow as a person and saying thank you to that person who gave it to you. Because uh, living in community, okay, so earlier you were talking about not having mirrors in your tiny house. I have this metaphor that living in community is like having mirrors reflecting back to you yourself, the good parts of yourself, your growing edges. And so that's interesting, you know, maybe look less in your physical mirror and look more into the mirror and the great opportunity that you get through interactions with other humans and um, being receptive to um, to that growth. And, and when you're in a challenging situation with someone, don't just go into, oh, it must be something wrong with them, like kind of doing that othering thing that we do a lot in our society right now. Like it's always the Democrats, it's always the Republicans, really instead taking a moment of self-responsibility and taking a moment to um, turn inwards and seeing what might I shift? How might I take responsibility for this moment? Um, I think that's for myself been huge in being able to navigate all kinds of complex situations that can come up in, in living in community. Uh, so those are two lessons that I would offer that, you know, maybe aren't the um, the, as like, you know, practical nuts and bolts, here's how you design a community and get zoning and handle your water. And all that is figure outable. So long as you have a strong community, has lots of social glue, and you have good skills as an individual to be a thriving member and a supportive member of your group dynamic. That's so beautiful. I love that. And you know, I long um, through that made me think about a revelation that I had that um, I just feel like um, maybe it could be relevant for someone watching. But um, I thought about love and what God designed love to be. And when you know, we were going through some difficult seasons, I mentioned we had like eight years of just straight up hard, <laughs> hard uh, circumstances. And uh, I just remember having this revelation that love is like a bomb. It's not exactly a glue, but um, that goes into the cracks, you know, of our hearts, of our life, you know, and so that we don't fall apart, you know, instead of just being broken and useless, right? The love just is a, like a bomb that comes through and brings healing. The scars are still there, you know, but, but it makes it to where um, we're, you know, we can still function, you know, and we can still have um, yeah, like we can still function, we can have purpose and, and those, um, those cracks and those scars are just part of our journey. And I love that you talked about uh, that glue. And one of the things that Jason and I are pretty passionate about is longevity. And in the Blue Zones books and, you know, the research, it does talk about how even in communities where maybe the... Um, nutrition or other things are not as important, uh, are not necessarily as important as, let's say, good as other communities. If they have like really good, uh, the social aspect is, is like really solid, then that compensates, let's say, for those other things. Because, you know, they're looking for those variables that make people live longer in community or living in community where you do have, like you said, not just being around people, but meaningful interactions is so important. And then when you talked about the mirrors, I do think we were saying the same thing is that when you're without mirrors, then you only have the mirror of the people yeah. and yourself, you know, sitting with yourself. And how does that really feel without the sound effects of um, and the visual effects of, of distractions? I do think that the the more that we have those raw human experiences, the more that we can grow. And yeah. lastly, you talked about feedback. Wow, that is really, that is, I think, the gold in, in being able to grow, to be, I mean, the gift of someone, they could just keep their opinion or the um, feedback to themselves. And they're giving you the gift of making themselves vulnerable for seeing it. I'm often that person. I had so many years where um, I wouldn't say anything to people. I wouldn't offer feedback. And, um, and I saw really either destructive 
uh, painful things that happen in their life because they didn't see it. And I tend to see things like a lot of times 10 years ahead, 20 years ahead, or, um, you know, in a situation I know where, you know, just know where instinctively where it's going to go. And it's so hard for me. And then I thought, you know what? Okay, I'm going to lose a friend or lose a friend <laughs> because mm-hmm. either they're just going to, their life is just going to derail and they don't, you know, they really um, have a really hard time continuing life as it is, or they get offended. But at least I can live with myself that I told them what I saw. I offered the gift of my feedback, uh, Mm -hmm. not as a judgment. And it is really hard for people, at least for people like me, um, when you do see it, to see it as like, oh, I'm not going to offer that. That's going to come off so judgmental. But I think we have the responsibility to learn how to bring it and deliver it in a way that's not. Not just say, I'm not going to do it because I don't know how to do it. So I was in this um, international conference. And someone gave me the best gift I've ever received. They actually asked for my permission to give me the feedback in a way that I was blown away. I mean, they were so emotionally intelligent that um, it just really impacted me. And and they said, you know, I have some feedback for you. Um, and if... Um, of course, I didn't mean to share this. I don't remember word for word, but I remember how it felt. But, but you know, she, she said, um, basically, she was letting me know that when she met me, she had a certain impression of me based on my handshake. Mm-hmm. And um, she came, like, from a corporate world. And she said, based on your handshake, I just, I was like, oh, you know, she doesn't really have anything to offer. Wait, wait, I'm telling you the feedback. Sorry, wait a minute. Let me back up and say, she said, I have some feedback for you um, that, uh, and she told, told me, would you be interested in it? She, she said some benefit, you know, I, I, I have some feedback for you that um, kind of affects uh, people when you int- introduce yourself or something. Would you be interested in hearing it? So sorry, I skipped <laughs> in the memory, in sharing the memory. Um, and I said, yes, I've never been asked that before. I've either not been given the um, feedback or um, being told way, way after the fact, which is not as helpful, right? Mm -hmm. Or not being told at all. So, Mm -hmm. uh, or I've been given it, you know, like I said, corrective judgment. It felt like, like, oh, I don't like how, you know, you do that or whatever, it doesn't come across. But when she asked for my permission, she basically held something of value that was a gift and she wanted to know if I would receive it. And I was like, wow, I, I, this is like the best experience I have had ever had with that. And I think we all have a responsibility. We all have that perspective, that mirror, like you said, we're mirroring back to people. And what a gift if we actually learn how to give that gift to people in a way that is um, a gift of love and like a respectful gift to help them grow instead of if we bring it in a way that, I mean, imagine if I, if you're thirsty and I just like throw water at you, I mean, I get, you know, I can put it in a cup and, you know, in countries like mine, we like wrap a little napkin around it or put it cause it's sweaty and you, you know, you want to make it like the most um, pleasant experience for somebody to be, you know, quenched of their thirst. Right. Mm. And I think we all really, want to grow especially if we're in a social setting we could just stay home right we all want to grow and um so that really inspired me uh back to the story she shared with me it's kind of funny um i was um trying to be overly respectful because of all these different um, nationalities and countries and stuff so my handshake was not so intentional like to be firm and to give her the gift of like I acknowledge you I see you and all of that anyway so she gave me some feedback about how that made her perceive me in a, in a different way and so um, she just said like it just really matters if you're going to shake somebody's hand like you got to do it intentionally mm-hmm. and um, so anyway that's what came to mind and thank you so much for these amazing jewels and gems and diamonds of wisdom that you've shared with us um, that can help us have a better vision of what's possible with communities, mm. uh, not be afraid to, to you called it the, the glue, right? To um, nurture that community glued. What did you call the, the glue? I tried to write it. Yeah, the community glue. Um, 
yeah, to to do that. I think that is amazing because you you do have to become vulnerable <laughs> to stem wow. out. Uh, but I guess the more vulnerable you are, the more sticky it is, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. And I think what you were sharing in that story is such an important tip to when you want to give feedback, always like ask permission first because mm -hmm. it just it gives the power to the individual who's receiving it and and helps them maybe feel more comfortable, both of you, in a vulnerable situation. So, yeah, yeah. and they can actually move forward instead of being blocked by it uh, we can cause people years right, you know mm -hmm. um of that blind spot growing right and that hardness in their heart maybe towards that important lesson so thank you so much cynthia i really expected this to be special um i wasn't sure you know where our conversation exactly would take us but it really just has been so rich and so meaningful to hear about uh your experiences and to hear the um, the wisdom that you've learned. And it does make me actually <laughs> more hopeful, you know, that it is possible. But like with everything else, it starts inside, it starts with mm -hmm. us. So mm -hmm. if we want to create uh, a more beautiful community around us, then we have to be willing to receive feedback, to give it in a loving way and be vulnerable and, and you know, be part of what creates that community glue that will help us move forward and uh, you know and create stronger communities mm -hmm. so uh to kind of wrap up is there any last thing as, as we were um closing is there anything that you would want people you know if there was one thing that you would want people to remember about um creating intentional communities what do you think that would be? If they don't remember anything else that we said today, or if they're tuning in right at the end, oh, I mean, if you are, go back to watch the replay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, well, I would just offer um, for folks who are really new to this idea of intentional community, not to um, be afraid of checking it out, exploring it. Um, there's some great resources that we're going to share more about soon. And um, maybe you look on the map of in different intentional communities and see if there's one near you that you want to go check out and visit or even just get inspired by. Um, I think that it was powerful for me as a young person to see just what is possible out there. Great. There's that website, um, ic.org. So the letter I and the letter c.org. This is the organization that I work with. And we have a directory of intentional communities as well as a whole bunch of other resources and um, can be an excellent way for you to see what's out there. And um, yeah, not to think that these are, uh, you know, something to be afraid of like a like a cult or you know just they're all you know hippie communes there's a huge diversity in the intentional communities movement and um, communities forming around all kinds of values and lifestyles it's all about fostering more of that community glue participatory decision making and processes and experimenting with new ways of being together new ways of communicating and fostering better group dynamics. So, yeah. Yeah, we have all kinds of books. <laughs> Good stuff on there. So I will ask you, because I saw the link about books. Um, it made me want to ask you this one last question about resources. Is there a book or a documentary that you have um, experienced or that you have heard people experience as something just really life-changing for them to um, help them in this area of intentional communities is there anything that you think um, you know we could highlight as uh, something to look into after watching this video yeah well if folks are interested in starting an intentional community um, the book actually on the very top of this page that you're on now um, creating a life together by a diana leaf christian that's an 
excellent, excellent book. It's kind of the foundational book on how to do a property search, set up your initial gr agreements with your group, gives a lot of case studies of various other intentional communities. So that's a great one for people who are looking to start a community. Diana also has another book on finding community if you're thinking of um, finding an existing community to join as that might be might be your path. Um, so yeah, I could offer that as a, a great resource. And I'll also mention if you are thinking of joining an existing community, um, my, my main job when I'm not working with the Foundation for Intentional Community is being this community matchmaker and offering people um, recommendations for specific communities that could be a good fit for them. Yeah, and that's my website, CynthiaTina.com. Tina is my last name, two first names. <laughs> yeah. Fabulous. Well, I'm excited to have had this opportunity to, um, to share your work. And if people are interested um, in reaching, reaching you, Cynthia, with any requests about the um, organization or your personal consulting services, um, I will, I have the links in the description, the video description. So um, reach out to Cynthia. And one thing I have loved about meeting you, Cynthia, is you're so approachable. I just love that about you. And it's just been um, wonderful to get to know you uh, more today. And um, if y'all have questions, either email Cynthia or you can comment uh, in this video and um, we will um, address your questions about community the best way that that we can moving forward and if you want to hear Cynthia or my or our, more of Cynthia's story or more of my story and Jason's story we are actually going to be together really soon again <laughs> um, this coming uh, May uh, mid-May it was like May 13th through 15th if I'm remembering the exact dates correctly mm -hmm. there is a link in the description uh, you can tune in for the live stream or you can come to Central Texas and see us in person for the event and get to know maybe uh, it's called Exit and Build Summit to help people who want to exit the um, conventional society and create more intentional community and that's what it's all about so yeah. you can click there and tune in and um, watch us or come see us. And again, Cynthia, I will put, I'm gonna put the screen back to us. Thank you so much again for the gift of your time today, of your uh, generous uh, expression of all of your um, experiences. And um, I, I always like to close our broadcast. I just want to say a quick blessing to all who are watching. May the Lord bless you and keep you and shine his face towards you. Be gracious unto you. Turn his countenance towards you and give you shalom peace. And thank you again, Cynthia. And we will see you all at the Exit and Build Summit very, very soon. Yes. Thank you so much, Aurora. I really appreciated this time and getting to know you as well. It thank was, you, everyone. Yeah, it was my, my pleasure. All my pleasure. <laughs>